this about me, but I am frugal. Um, Lily would probably use another word that isn't as nice as the word frugal, but I'm frugal. I take care in how I spend money. When we were researching a new car, not, not a new one now, but before when we bought the Prius, I, I made a spreadsheet, and the two big things that we were worried about was whether or not Lily can sit between the two car seats in the back seat so that when Ama, when Grandma visited, she'd be able to sit in the front seat, Lily can sit in the back seat. That was one criteria. The other criteria was how cheap could the car be over its lifetime in terms of the price and gas. So I had like current gas prices plus gas mileage and all of these spreadsheets to try to make it the cheapest possible. I'm frugal, but I wasn't always frugal. Uh, my parents used to say that money would just burn a hole in my pocket. When I was younger, I would help mow the, the, the lawn at my dad's work, and I would get 10, 15 bucks for that, and I would just spend that right away. But something switched, something changed in my life, and I think it was around the age of 16 when I started working for real. And I think it probably was because of my love of video games. Because a new console was coming out, the Nintendo 64. And it wasn't coming out during Christmas, it was coming out in early fall. So I couldn't just wait for Christmas and have a joint present for that. I wanted it now, and I could actually see myself making enough money to afford this thing. So here I am, scooping up frozen custard day after day at Jimmy's Frozen Custard on Mulford Road and East 8th Street in Rockford, Illinois, trying to save up enough money so that I could get this thing I wanted because it was Super Mario in 3D. No, no longer 2D, but in 3D. This love of video games transformed me to say, I'm not going to spend anymore. I'm not just going to spend on whatever I see, whatever I want, whatever I could consume. But I said, I want something bigger. I want something better. I want something greater. And it changed my life. Love transforms us. Love makes us count the cost in different ways. Now that's silly, right? I mean, video games transforming lives, right? But is there something greater? Is there a love that can transform us even more? That makes us count costs in different ways? And we see today that Jesus touches on this. I don't know if touches on it is the right word. He smashes it apart. He wakes us up. He wakes up the crowds to say, there is something greater that will cost us absolutely everything. And is it worth it? Let us pray. Lord, help us see your truth through Jesus Christ, who is the truth. Amen. I think the first verse that we read here sets up the context for the harshness to follow. Verse 25, now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned to them and said the following. So Jesus, I mean, who wouldn't want to follow Jesus, right? Jesus is the one who challenges authority, abusive authority. He's the one that heals. He is the one who destroys demons through exorcism. He's the one that heals the broken and lifts up the downtrodden and the humble. I mean, that's, that's great. Who wouldn't want to follow that? Crowds are fun to follow. I've shared before when uh, my football team, the, the University of Illinois, uh, the year before I went to the University of Illinois, they were 0-11. You can't get worse than that. And so the, the, the next year when I was a freshman, I would go to these games. When we won the first game, we stormed the field. I mean, we were, what, 1-2 and two at that point, and there was no way we were going to make a bowl game, but we like celebrated like we won the national championship because we won a game, but it's just intoxicating when you see people streaming. I don't know, has anyone seen this uh, video about in Taiwan, Pokemon Go in Taiwan? Yeah. Uh, apparently a rare Pokemon is, is sighted, and all of these people are streaming through the streets, and you hear the guy in the camera filming this, he's like, don't she? Like, what, what, what in the world is happening? And then you hear his wife or, uh, I don't know, someone say, well, what you know, I don't know. I don't know what, what is happening. But this huge crowd, we were just talking about this in Sunday school, and one of the boys said that there is a place that kind of spawns these rare Pokemon in Taiwan to such an extent that, like, the crowds are always there and cars can't, like, drive in that area anymore. Just because of this, being a part of a crowd is intoxicating. 
it's fun. But there's a danger. Sometimes we join crowds knowing very little why we're going there. I, I can just imagine some people in Taiwan just saying, okay, I guess we, you know, I don't know if there's an attack behind us or something, but we, we, let's just go with the flow. Let's just join the crowd because it's fun, it's intoxicating, it's great to be part of something bigger. I mean, you hear about the psychology of pop songs, that some of these songs are so horrible, but how can you not go along with the crowd when you hear it in every single restaurant you're in, every single grocery store, on every single radio? You hear the song over and over again. How can we not just join the flow of that? We see everyone else driving the same car, so we begin wanting one. We see the activity of our friends and colleagues on Facebook or LinkedIn, and we want our lives to conform to that have the same experiences as they do. Crowds are powerful forces because we're social creatures. But they can be dangerous as we're swept up in those mo in their momentum and forget, or never really acknowledge in the beginning why we are there in the first place. The crowds are large and they're following Jesus. Because it's cool. Because it's nice. Here is the one who may soon be in charge of everything. If he's truly Messiah, he's going to be the king. And it's great to follow him. But Jesus wants to make sure, you're following me, but do you know where I'm going? I have turned my face. Jesus turns his face, it says in scripture, to Jerusalem. He knows where it's headed. He knows what awaits him in Jerusalem. That's where he's going. And he turns to those crowds and says, do you know? You're following me, but are you really following me? Do you really understand where I'm going? Where's the end game? Verse 27 makes it very clear. I'm going to a cross. If you think you're following me, there's cross involved. And I'm not asking you to carry my cross. I'm asking you to carry your cross. It's going to look different for you. Whoever wants to follow me must keep up their cross. This is a crowd that isn't following a rare Pokemon sighting or lining up to upgrade to the iPhone 7 or from Vail this week or freaking out about the new El Beyonce album that just dropped. But this is someone who will carry their own execution device. This is who you are following. <coughs> Jesus uses this word cost here in this passage, and it's the only time in the New Testament that this word cost is being used. So what is the cost of following Jesus? What currency can you use? Cold hard cash, U.S. dollars, denarii, as in the, as in the Bible, time, volunteering for the needy. Jesus says the only currency he accepts as payment to follow him is your your life. That's all. That's all that's involved. And he's hitting at every different angle. Hate your family. Take a cross. Sell everything that you have. The cost is everything. Jesus' word to us today is harsh. Hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Imagine if I taught you that. Say hate everyone in that TM over there that you're related to. <laughs> I would not have a job for very long, right? Just hate them. Let's you know, let's start our own church and let's live. This is what he's saying. If that's not enough for you, hate your very life. Hate your own life. Hate yourself. Take up your cross. Not just a way of execution, but a way of torture. It's still not enough. Sell everything that you have. Hate loved ones. Hate your life. Sell everything. That's a hard sell. That's a hard sell without knowing what I'm getting in return, right? Mm -hmm. You want me to give everything to follow you. What does that give me? Does, that, does it end at the cross, Jesus? If it ends at the cross, I, I, I don't want any part of it. Following Jesus is absolutely insane if the end is Jerusalem, if the end is the cross. I don't want give up. I'm not calling anyone to give up. Jesus isn't calling everyone to give up everything to go to the cross. But there's something more to gain. 
What if this hate and pain were not what awaited us in the end, just what we encountered on the way to the destination? Did your parents ever give you a small amount of money to go into a store and they say, you can buy anything you want, here's a dollar? Anyone ever have that experience growing up? Yeah, okay, good. It's like, man, I'm the only one. But they imagine it as a kid. Here's a dollar, you can spend it on anything you want. And then as a kid, you, you have to start doing some calculation. Okay, you see the bubble gum is five cents a piece, and I can get 20 of them. Wait, I gotta pay tax? Ah, oh, okay, I gotta you know, do less. Or one big thing for a dollar, or something more expensive. Or you have to calculate, you have to say, what is worth this one dollar I have? It's all I have, and I have to spend it now. What am, what should I spend on? What should I get in return? You and I have one life to spend. Right? One life. We can get anything we want with this life. What will it be? Should we spend it on amassing power at all costs, perhaps fame, pleasure, on a favorite addiction, maybe? Put it this way, I think things get much clearer. We do have one life to spend. Jesus is right, but what do we spend it on? What is worth it? Is it worth a life to spend on these other things? Or is following the one who actually defeats death, who gives us eternal life in return, is that worth it? That's the only way I can make sense of the harshness of Jesus' words, of the challenge of Jesus' words, Give everything. I can only do that if I know I'm giving everything back. And then some. To know that life doesn't end at a cross. But God honors self-sacrifice. When we spend our life for others as Jesus gave his life for us, we are given life in abundance. Only undying life could be worth such unrelenting sacrifice. What Jesus is saying to the crowds is that following him will be tough. You can't just join the crowd and get off at the next stop. It's going to be tough. My destination is hard. It will challenge us. It will transform us. The need to buy a video game system on day one was enough for me to transform a part of my life. How much more is following the one who changed world history worth it to change and transform our lives as we focus on following yeah. There's a girl in our church back in Chicago, Naomi, and she's a wonderful, wonderful uh, woman who went to school to teach music. So she was a music major and an educator. And as she went down to school, she, we knew she was going to try out different fellowships. But there's one fellowship down there, a Korean American fellowship, that's very intense spiritually. So intense that sometimes people don't do their homework and flunk out of college because they're so focused on doing these all night prayer meetings and going to small group and everything. So even like pastors' kids will be a little bit scared and say, "You can join any fellowship, just don't don't join them." Like because somehow it's just it's too intense, and some people just can't balance that life. Can't say, enough, like, I, I, I'm here for a reason. Yeah. So I had to struggle because she, she wanted to talk to me and she said, you know, she joined this, this group and I knew it would be intense for her and she said, you know, I'm changing majors. I, I realized that as I play my music, it's for me and for my own pride and I can't do it for God. Therefore, I have to change. And in my mind, I had all these things that going in the back of my mind of this campus ministry and the pressure they put on people. And I, and I really wanted to just start to say, no, no, you can, you, you can learn. You can learn to harness it for God. You don't have to stop. You don't have to completely change your life trajectory for all of this. But as I thought about it, I was like, she's trying to follow Jesus, right? She's trying to count the cost. Jesus is the one that said, hate your family, sell your possessions, take up your cross. Who am I to define what that cross-bearing looks like in this life's life? So I said, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you're right or wrong. Maybe, maybe you're messing up. Maybe you're misinterpreting. 
what's going on in your life right now, but I want to acknowledge you're trying to follow Jesus. And that is good. That heart is a good heart. If I try to force you to try to talk away the harshness of Jesus or, or, or think away around this where you can have a divided heart and still follow God, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to risk that because your heart is in the right place. You want to follow Jesus. You want to count the cost. You want to carry the cross. And that's fine. I don't get to tell someone what their cross is. I don't get to say, put down your cross, you're making the crowd look bad. I don't know what your cross is. But I better know mine, and I better be carrying it. Because if you aren't carrying a cross, you're not following Jesus. I think that's what Jesus is saying to us today through this passage. Aren't carrying a cross. Too much of Christianity is just everything's fine and you don't have to give up anything. But Jesus' word to us is there is a cost to following me. It looks different for every one of us, but there is a cost to follow. So, what's your cross? What is following Jesus costing you? It should cost something. Let me tell you, as I study this passage, I want to explain the way Jesus called. I want to, you know, bring it down a level, bring it down a few notches so it doesn't sound so harsh to us. I want to blunt that sharp edge of his words. I want to say Jesus exaggerates to make a point, to make us pay closer attention, but I don't think I can do so because I think Jesus might be serious. He called people very literally sell everything that they had in that time. Some of them actually did carry crosses, literal crosses in their time. So who am I to say, don't worry, your life is fine, you don't have to give up in it. Jesus does call us to profound discipleship. Jesus said, you're, you need to think about what you're doing when you follow me just as much someone who's building a building comes to cost to make sure they have enough money to complete the project. Just as someone who goes to war and needs to figure out, can I actually take this, this other kingdom on and destroy them? If not, I better make some other things. You have to count the cost. Each of us, it's only one life. How will we spend it? It's for Jesus, it's time to lay down that life, to take up your cross, to follow. Let us pray. For your word is harsh to us. It wakes us up, it shakes us up. It makes us realize that all too often we go along with the crowd. But help us, Lord, have clarity in our life know what our cross is, to know what it is that we need to give up in order to follow you. Help us, Lord, to know not just the harshness, but the promise as well. To know why we are doing this is because you are the one who holds all things in his hand. The one who is exalted above all, whose name is above all names, who has defeated death and wants to share life with us. Lord, help us. Give us clarity today. Pierce us with your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now is the time for offering.